this morning by talking, first of all, about the readings. You should be downloading them either all at once or before each lecture. And I want to talk about the reason that they were chosen. Uh, they're chosen very carefully because they deal with issues of understanding architecture and understanding the place of architecture in society and culture. Uh, now, that's a very fraught subject because understanding anything involves all sorts of prejudices, which I'll keep coming back to, all sorts of presuppositions. <clears throat> so we have a habit of summarizing our understanding of something by talking about our interpretation of it. So the readings are many of them geared to issues of interpretation and understanding. <clears throat> when you're talking about scientific or medical research, <clears throat> you are talking about dealing very carefully with specific facts on which you build in a logical way in linear thinking. <clears throat> now, that means that uh, science and medicine can actually develop very fast and are doing so. However, this is unfortunately not true of scholarship. Scholarship involves interpretation. <clears throat> and scholarship therefore involves opinion. And opinion can change very fast and mean that interpretation changes in all sorts of ways, many of which are quite illogical. <clears throat> so I want to talk about the choice of the readings, and particularly who did the who were the authors of these readings? They are people who have been studying humanity and the hum human condition, not necessarily in their own field, but who appreciate quite quickly that architecture is one way of interpreting the nature of human beings and their culture. <clears throat> so we have a famous linguist, Umberto Eco, who became a sociologist and an anthropologist. Uh, and uh, you have heard an extract from his writing last week. He was a student of language in relation to human society. He came to regard the symbolism of language as being reflected in architecture. Uh, and just as I tried to explain last week very quickly, Linguists realized that the earliest words were invented by human beings from concepts and became symbols of those concepts, often because they sounded like what they represented. <clears throat> and they quickly, scholars quickly began to realize as they studied linguistics that the same was true of architecture, that it is made up of concepts which are symbolic, just like language. <clears throat> so to the linguists, architecture is another language. <clears throat> and people like Umberto Eco are interested in the symbolic depths of language. <clears throat> Indeed, many, <clears throat> many of the authors in your readings are anthropologists or sociologists <clears throat> or philosophers, all of whom are interested in the way in which architecture talks to us and has meaning for us. <clears throat> These are quite distinct from the practicing designers, uh, the artists. But we do find, <clears throat> I'm sorry, some architects or artists have actually 
delved into the same subject. More than a hundred years ago, a fascinating example of that <coughs> was a very good German architect, Gottfried Semper, whom I also talked about in the last lecture. And he was one of the first people to be interested in primitive architecture. <coughs> Another uh, example of this kind of approach is the psychologist. A very good example of that is Carl Jung. Carl Jung, in case you didn't know it, was uh, a famous disciple of Sigmund Freud. And they worked very closely together until they divided because Freud thought that understanding human beings came primarily from sexuality. Whereas Jung thought that that was too narrow and we should rather understand human beings if we look at the way children relate to the world through their understanding of the symbolic meaning of their experience of the world. And so for Jung, symbolism became the main factor in human nature and in human understanding. He thought that we all reacted internally to the symbolic meaning of our experiences in everyday life. And we continue to do that throughout our lives. <clears throat> Now, the result of all that research is that some encyclopedic articles are very well written from this point of view. <clears throat> this is particularly true of the articles in a German encyclopedia, which was afterwards translated into Italian and then into English, which is in your library called the Encyclopedia of World Art. And I've included a number of entries <clears throat> on the meaning of architecture in the readings from the Encyclopedia of World Art. <clears throat> An architect who became very interested in the idea of understanding and interpreting architecture in society was Mimi Lobel of Yale University. And I have uh, included an article of hers on uh, understanding early architectures through conceptual symbolism. <coughs> then, <coughs> then there is the uh, amazing man, Gaston Bachelard, a Frenchman. He shocked the French world when he was appointed to the Sorbonne University for, as the first philosopher of science and he immediately published a book called The Poetics of Space. <clears throat> In other words, a book about architecture and architectural experience. And he went on to publish another book, The Poetics of Fire, <clears throat> which is about the poetics of experience in everyday life and in extreme situations. These, both these books are quite small and are really worth reading from cover to cover. But I have included extracts in the readings. <clears throat> then there is a Canadian, Frederick Jamison, a professor at Toronto, who became very interested <clears throat> in the idea of interpreting the subconscious through symbolism. Now, there is a slight slant to his work in that he tends to think that everything is related to humans working as gro in groups and indeed to the importance of human beings operating in groups. And so he used a term, political, to, sub to represent that. When he talks about the subconscious, he talks about the political subconscious. <coughs> But don't be put off by that, because he's a very interesting thinker and has been very influential. <clears throat> he writes about the way we interpret our experiences in our everyday lives in terms of group experiences, in terms of the subconscious and the, and the conscious 
in our lives. <clears throat> he believes, as indeed most psychologists now do, that nine-tenths of our experiences are not even subconscious. They are hidden below the subconscious. We don't know about them at all. And we have no way of getting at them, access to them. <clears throat> I think, although Jamison is very hard reading, that it's worth trying to pursue it to get some understanding of it. <clears throat> then we come to Claude Levi-Strauss. He is the favorite of anthropologists, a Frenchman who spent most of his career studying the Amazonian Indians. <clears throat> he believed that everything that happens in a society can be explained and understood if you reach into the ideology of the society. That is that everything is reinterpreted by us in terms of our ideologies. <clears throat> what that means is that we bring to experience the kind of predisposition that comes to us from our first experiences as a group. We bring to interpretation the biases that are our society's ideologies. So we are not impartial observers. We are not impartial interpreters. We are all of us conditioned in various ways. In order to understand the creation of architecture, we have to understand that it is created inside that situation. Now what that means is that to understand the culture of another, I'm sorry, sorry, to start understand the architecture of another culture is very difficult. <clears throat> it is very hard to get inside the personal and collective experiences of another society, of another culture. You can make huge efforts <clears throat> and, and unless they are very deep-seated, it is very hard to be sure that you are understanding the architecture correctly. So we are faced with that in this course, for we'll be dealing with dozens of different cultures and different societies. And the problem is, how do we, how we, how we sure that we may be interpreting them the way the people who built the architecture were doing it? Uh, so I'm giving you the readings to try to think about the meaning of interpretation. <clears throat> the problem, uh, problems of your unconscious and how that is affecting the way you are seeing things. <clears throat> You've probably noticed that when you are with somebody and point out things you've seen, they often haven't seen them. They have to look and realize they've missed them. Well, that's even truer when we come to the big issues of architecture. Well, we've reached the situation where we've been talking about the concepts which are symbolic in architecture and which meaning we think had great meaning to those people in those cultures for the design of their buildings and the design of their communities. <clears throat> There's one other issue related to this interpretation, and that is emotion. To what extent do we have emotional reactions when we interpret? To what extent do we have emotional reactions to symbols? Well, think of the swastika. Think of the Christian symbol of the cross. Think of the Jewish symbol of the star. Different people in different cultures have different reactions to these symbols, don't they? But we've got to realize that that is also deliberate. Symbols are meant to have emotional associations. <clears throat> and the architecture that is involved in interpreting uh, 
its generations through concepts which are symbols is involved in that use of emotional reaction. <clears throat> and so when we go to a church, the form gives an emotional reaction, doesn't it? Whether we like it or not. <clears throat> now I've given you a timeline to show you how quickly in the last 5,000, 10,000 years, things have changed. I don't need to emphasize how rapid change has been. If you've lived in the last 100 years, it's extraordinary how rapid change is. But the timeline shows the acceleration of change in human experience. <coughs> and I wanted to show you that <coughs> related to that change is this diagram at the bottom how ethnic groups evolve. <clears throat> now, one has to realize that populations have increased enormously fast. When we are talking about the earliest populations in places like Great Britain or France, we're talking about a few thousand. <clears throat> but very rapidly, we're talking about tens of thousands and then hundreds of thousands and then millions. But even then, the numbers were small until about 150, 200 years ago, relative to today. <clears throat> People were generally eking out an existence for a very long period of time. They learned agriculture, they learned to pasture their, their flock. But as the numbers grew, <clears throat> it became an issue of how they divided the land. And the land became divided, first of all, into, by tribes. And then the, the land which was claimed by a tribe was subdivided according to the clans. And then eventually it was subdivided again to allow extended families to have the use of certain bits of land and access, primary access to those bits of land. And then finally, of course, it broke up further and we start to get very complicated systems of government with nuclear families. I've tried to give the numbers of people that were probably in the tribes, between 2,000 and 20,000 in the tribes, <coughs> and then the, in the clans probably bet generally between 200 and 2,000, <coughs> and in the extended families between 10 and 100, but usually about 20, 20 to 30. And then in the nuclear families, uh, of course, starting with two, and not generally more than 12, if you include all the aunts and uncles and the people you had to look after, grandparents. In the last lecture, we were looking at, uh, at towards the end of the lecture, at some curious concepts or symbols, <coughs> which were based on uh, the uh, bodies in the heavens, particularly on the moon and the sun, and which uh, took over those shapes for protection from divine spirits. <clears throat> and so here we have a large communal building which is circular. <clears throat> <coughs> so it had a lot of people living in it, and it was clearly a building for social cohesion, communal life, and mutual protection. And that was in Mesopotamia. Now I want to show you one in China. As you can see, it's a Harker dwelling. It's also perfectly circular for the same reason, the protection, the divine protection of the circular shape. Uh, and it has a courtyard in the middle with separate dwelling user, units around it. Uh, uh, and it's clear that uh, these people were needed, they felt the need for mutual protection, mutual cohesion. Now the reason for that, in this case, we know. The Hakka people were foreigners in the area they lived in in China. They came from at least a thousand miles away. We're not sure where they came from, possibly more than that, 2,000 miles away. They had been driven to this area of China, the East Coast, because of the need for work, and perhaps because they'd been driven out of their homeland. 
<coughs> and they settled down in hundreds of people, hundreds of, of uh, communities along the east coast of China, and became, they became the, the sort of basic workers, the migrant workers in eastern China about 600 years ago. <coughs> and they must have been regarded as inferior people, certainly as alien people by the local inhabitants. And so they lived together in these tight-knit communities for mutual protection. Uh, and they were able to close the gates. So we'll have a look at one of them. You can see how defensive they were in, in mentally, conceptually defensive. Uh, of course, it's possible to argue that they are meant to be physically defensive too, and probably at times they were. But what's really more important is to understand that the form suggests a need for divine protection, for mutual protection. Uh, so they are communal buildings, and you see them inside, they're sometimes three or four stories high inside, always with a central court. Uh, generally only one entrance, or the most two, very rarely more. Uh, and uh, open air activities took place in the courtyard, and they slept and were uh, acted as families in the uh, private rooms. Uh, the uh, evidence is that they uh, were uh, trying to integrate into the society, yes? No, for more. They would, although they were small, they would have been 10 to 16 people. You know. So the, I mean, as you'll see, some of them are very big. The one you've just seen, uh, I suppose, was about uh, 80 feet to 100 feet across. Now, you, there are hundreds of these circular communities along the eastern coast of China, or were, and you can see here in, the, in this photograph three of them in a row. Uh, and uh, they nearly always had basically the same shape, uh, and um, they uh, became a very powerful force in the eastern side of China. Some of the activities happened outside the circular shape. As you can see here, uh, these are areas of grain that are being dried in the sun. Um, some of them had other activities like laundry outside of the main building, and some of them get very large. You notice that if you look at the plan, that there's actually a courtyard in the dwelling units. It runs down through the height of the building so that every dwelling unit on every level has its own little courtyard, open space where things can happen and be dried and they get light and air. And there's a, nearly always a main entrance room, which is for the, the main room of the house, and some private rooms at the back. But there are a lot of variations on that type. Uh, this one is very interesting because uh, you see that there is a main axis at the bottom that runs vertically through and reaches a huge room on the opposite side of the courtyard. And that huge room is the hall of the ancestors for the whole community. It's where these shrines of the ancestors are set up. <coughs> now you might well say, well, how can one community have shared ancestors? Well, of course, that's the point about a clan, isn't it? Clans have shared ancestors. That's why they're a clan. <coughs> Indeed, tribes have shared ancestors. They're descended from the sons of Abraham, in the case of the Israeli tribes. <coughs> so there, it's perfectly reasonable for a clan building like this to have one hall of prayer to the ancestors in the center. <coughs> Having accepted that that's the pattern, at the bottom you can see that there's an entrance court inside the front entrance, and the space around that is a kind of reception hall for visitors to the clan. They really get quite impressive. And in the very biggest ones, you actually get buildings in the center, which are often utility buildings, kitchens and uh, uh, laundries and so on. <clears throat> now, not surprisingly, uh, Chinese historians are, are arguing that they're very much defensive buildings, although I think you must have seen from the plans that there's not much evidence of a defensive 
uh, approach in the design of the buildings, <coughs> except for the outside wall being very high and solid and the shape being circular. Anyway, here they are being used for defense as well. And of course, in a way, a communal building, which is a spiritual shape, is taking on that form for defensive reasons, but it uh, protects the community as a whole against all forces and not just aggression from uh, outside. Sometimes the Haka village is expanded like that very rapidly away from the circular core. And that happened in many parts of China as Hakka people traveled around and the influences traveled in different areas. This is a, a fraught subject because not much archaeology has yet taken place in China relative to many other parts of the world. And particularly archaeology on the level of studying habitations in the last 1,000 years, not a lot has happened in China. And so we still are not sure how extensive this use of this uh, concept of the uh, protective circle was in Chinese history. But there's no question about the, uh, the fact that there are many, many examples of it in different parts of China. <coughs> Here's one of the buildings in the center of the courtyard. Now, in the last lecture, I talked about circular buildings in China, and I talked about the tents that were temporary tents with a, a, a wooden frame that were erected by the nomads in the deserts to the west and the north. <coughs> and as I showed you, remember, how they were padded on the outside when they'd been erected, and how they could be erected in three hours, and then, or taken down in very, very short time, and then the frame put on the back of animals and carried to another site. So they were amazing tent constructions. But the significant thing for us is that they were tents for extended families and that they were circular in shape. Again, you could say circular in shape for practical reasons, but there's no question, we think, of the significance of the form. However, the Harker people changed. And in the last 200 years, they've started to build rectangular buildings. Now, you may say that is a way of assimilating into the culture they had come into from the west into the east. And they're accepting now Taoist ideas of order. Man-made things are rectangular. Only nature uses the circle. <coughs> but what is intriguing is that when they do go rectangular, they keep many of the same principles in the design of the community. But now you start to get straight streets instead of just a circular courtyard in the middle. We still have the same hall of entry and the same hall of the ancestors. And the back, building at the back, which is darker at the top, is, of course, the home of the chieftain. And then you get the houses of all the people who belong on two or three stories high. Uh, and each one has a central room for living and side <coughs> rooms. <coughs> and linking them are streets. Now, this becomes a prototype for uh, some large, quite large Haka buildings, which can get uh, more and more complicated and become small towns. Now, I am showing you communal buildings and the forms that they take in Asia. <coughs> but before we leave the subject, I wanted to make sure you realize that at this phase of human evolution, in which we're talking about the clan structure, the extended family structure, that is happening all over the world. It's not limited to Asia. <coughs> For instance, here are the prototype buildings of Europe. These are the most ancient uh, houses that have been found in Europe, dating back to 8,000 to 10,000 BC. And they're found in, uh, a lot of them are found now in the flatlands of the river estuaries in places like Poland and Germany, and 
uh, to a lesser extent in Austria and Hungary. But uh, it's believed that they were much more extensive originally <coughs> over the most of Europe. And the basic idea was uh, that you had a rectangular building because they were building in wood. And there's a limit to the span of timber. And so a wooden building becomes much more, uh, much likely to be rectangular. <coughs> it doesn't have the, uh, the symbolic uh, issue of the Chinese ones, but it is a communal building in which uh, they, for mutual protection, uh, they live together in a large community. And you can tell how large it is because the black blobs in the center of the plan are the large stones that were under the hearths for the fires, large flat stones to keep the fire from getting damp. <coughs> and so that one, as you can see, has seven fireplaces. So if you assume that around the fire you would have your typical extended family, perhaps averaging 30 to 40 people, you've got a large community here, something like 200 people to 300 people living in one building. So it's a typical clan building, very like the Chinese uh, Hakka building, except that it's not circular, it's long and rectangular. The, the stones along the sides, of course, are the foundation stone under the wooden upright to stop the wooden up, uh, upright from rotting so quickly uh, underground. By the way, you've got some si a sense of size there from the scale. So you saw 40 feet, they were about 200 feet long. And then if you get a number of them built together for mutual protection, social cohesion, you start to get what we would call a village. <coughs> what is amazing is how, how early they are. They're, they're at least 5,000 to 6,000 BC. Some archaeologists believe they can date them earlier. <coughs> so we have very early examples of the growth of human society. <coughs> but in buildings which are communal buildings, and of course, the same thing is true in both North and South America. In North America, we have very good evidence for them because we have the writings of the early explorers, the early Europeans. And in South America, they're still being built. <coughs> so here they are in North America. This is in the area of Chicago. Um, light timber frames, very similar plan to those of Northern Europe. And here's what they were like inside from a 17th, 18th century drawing. And here's a plan from the 18th century, 1743. It was 80 feet long, this building. Uh, it had a common passage with fireplaces all the way down. Uh, two or four of these units would share one fireplace in the, in the center. <coughs> and at the end, there would be the throne you've just seen of the chief of the, of the uh, community. <coughs> here's a similar 18th century plan in which you can see that the fireplaces must have been in the center of the path down the middle. <coughs> and <coughs> here are photographs, photographs of some in South America. So um, this one is a huge building, about 400 feet long. And inside it uh, housed not only the whole community, but also all the farm implements, all the animals as well. <coughs> and. Uh, as you see, it has a single entrance. Amazing, huh? And they simply allow for the smoke to go out through the thatch and for light to filter in, but they're very dark inside. And living in that one is about 250 people. I have actually a film of that being used, but since we're not talking about South America, but Asia, I won't show it to you today, but they, it's still in use. So we come back to Asia. Now in Asia, we have some very sophisticated examples of communal houses. <coughs> these, they, you, you could call the, the Hakka houses round houses. And these are long houses. Sometimes in the European ones, they're sometimes called hall houses. But long house is a very good term for this. Now this is the kind <coughs> of communal house that they were building in Southeast Asia until the Second World War. A cousin of mine went to Borneo recently, and there still are still some people living in them, but whether they're building new ones, I'm not sure. Maybe some of you know. <coughs> they have a magnificent uh, plan 
because the housing units are on one side of a street <coughs> and the other side of the street becomes open, open air space for the householder to use. So um, where, where you can see the living room here with the storeroom above in the roof. Uh, if you go across the public street, you come out into an open air area where you can dry your clothes and do open air work for uh, manufacturing. <coughs> the approach is up a log. So here is the street. <coughs> open air on one side and the houses on the left. And here is the open air area where we, on bamboo logs they can spread out their, their cl the cloth they are weaving or the w work that they are doing or the clothes that they are drying. You can see they're all weavers in this particular community. This one's from Borneo. <coughs> here is the end of it. The whole building is raised up and you notice the roof has changed its shape. The reason for that is that if you want to extend a rectangular building, it's quite easy, isn't it? You can extend it at the ends. And so that's what they did. As they wanted to make them larger, they would add on more rooms. So the, the junior people live at the ends and are most exposed to attack. The chief and the senior members live in the middle. And underneath this high raised platform, it's, it's, the whole thing is raised 10 to 15 feet above the ground. And because of the, uh, it's, it's a, a very tropical, very humid, therefore very damp conditions at ground level. <coughs> and because of that, they've raised the whole building up to protect it from the damp. And uh, the space underneath, of course, is used for animals. <coughs> now that was in Borneo. And here is an example in Vietnam. <coughs> Not quite the same plan, very beautifully made. Uh, and often in Vietnam, you get two or three of them side by side linked together with a bridge. Made, of, made <coughs> largely of bamboo, of course. And here's the street. And there is a, a sense of a storeroom in the roof. And here we are looking at uh, a development which happened soon afterwards. In Vietnam, as build these long houses, you find also houses which are smaller. <coughs> and these are the beginnings of the breaking up of the clan structure into extended family houses. So uh, you now see a number of houses which are smaller. Uh, and they take very much the same form as the clan house. They're also raised up high. They have the same materials but they're now reduced in size. And they often linked together with bridges. <coughs> so here you see a typical example. Notice that the notched log, which was used to, as a staircase, as a way of climbing a ladder to get into the uh, Borneo one, is now replaced by a modern ladder. <coughs> and of course, we get uh, not only animals kept underneath, but also uh, household goods and some of the work is done underneath. And the materials are, are very simple, easily obtained materials, bamboo and uh, the uh, bamboo leaves and so on, all split bamboos and woven together very beautifully. Marvelous workmanship. <coughs> but there is something happening here which is new. I don't know whether you noticed it. What about the roof? <clears throat> it's not made out of bamboo or out of thatch or any natural material. It's actually fired terracotta tiles. Now is that uh, an example of being modern or is there a reason for it? <clears throat> well, is the reason, reason perhaps insulation or thermal? Are tiles better insulators than thatch or grass? No, they're not. <coughs> so the reason is not thermal, not to do with climate. <coughs> is it to do with fire? Not really, is it? Because the rest of the building can burn anyway. So why change over right through the buildings consistently uh, from thatch to 
a heavier material made out of uh, fired terracotta. Well, I, one argument could be, of course, that thatch has to be replaced. If it's on the weather side of a building, it has to be replaced quite often, certainly every 40 years, often every 20 years. And that's quite an elaborate procedure and quite expensive. So that could be one argument. But there is another argument. <coughs> Would anybody like to guess what the other argument is for using tiles as a roofing instead of thatch or grass? Yes, you could say, but actually thatch is very good against heavy rain. It's pretty good, so it's not, I don't think that's the real reason. Yeah. Just the weight of the material to hold the building down in storms. Well, it certainly holds it together. Now, you said in storms, and that's a good point. But, of course, what's really more important than storms is that this is an earthquake region. We're at the edge of a, an, a fault in the earth, aren't we? So we get a lot of earthquakes in this region. <coughs> now, if you're dealing with earth movement, it's worse than a storm, isn't it? And so the danger of the whole building just being pulled together to pieces and disintegrating is very high. But if you weigh it down with a heavy roof, there's much more chance that it won't disintegrate. Particularly since uh, we understand now that <coughs> if it's a light building and, it, and there's an earth movement, it will sway exaggerated away, won't it? <coughs> but if it's a heavy roof, it'll, it'll be slowed down. So instead of moving as fast as the ground, it'll start moving more slowly because of the weight of the roof. <coughs> the result is it, the, the building comes, gets out of sync with the earth movements and therefore it starts, it stops breaking up. So they found very long ago, uh, it looks like it was uh, uh, one and a half thousand years ago, that using a heavy roof was a way of protecting a building against an earthquake. And so they started to do that in these Vietnamese very primitive buildings. Oh, we saw a bridge there, and here's another one. These are very characteristic of this architecture. They linked the buildings together at a higher level uh, so that there were still family, family links. There, were, there was social cohesion at a higher level, and you could go across over without going down to the ground. Or you had a ramp up, as in this case, when you wanted to take your bicycle up. And you get lovely open courtyards between the houses and at the ends of the houses. Now, from that, you get the emergence of the nuclear house in Southeast Asia. <coughs> and here's a typical nuclear house. When I say nuclear, uh, you, they don't really have small families. You're really talking about an extended family of 15 to 20 people in a building like this. But what I want, now want to talk about is the way <coughs> they dealt with visitors. <coughs> Just as the Harker House or the big clan houses tended to have a, a, an entrance room, which was a room in which you received strangers and visitors. So the same is true of all these buildings uh, in Southeast Asia. They tend to have a, a, a space where visitors are received. <coughs> the, uh, many of these houses, like this Khmer house, have two spaces, one internal and one external, and they're separated by a step. So the outside one is lower than the inside one. Uh, and what's the reason for that? Well, you can understand why, can't you? If you're receiving people who are from your clan or your tribe, they, they're fellow members of the same community, you can bring them into your house to a reception inside the house. But if they're strangers, nothing to do with your tribe or your clan, you receive them outdoors on a deck outside the house. <coughs> the deck can be at the end or it can be at the side. So here's what these houses look like. Of course, lots of agriculture going on outside. Next. Always raised up high. And this one gives us a chance to look at these different uh, reception areas. Uh, you see we have uh, an outer reception area and a bridge to another one, and then we have an inner reception area. Uh, behind the inner reception area we have two rooms, which are the main sleeping rooms for the people in the house. 
or for the main family in the house. And at the back you have another room, which of course is a private kitchen. Uh, there's a washing room on the side, veranda. That idea of distinguishing between people who were within your tribe or your clan and people who were outside is very characteristic of many societies. You often had different reception areas for them. What is intriguing about this house too is the way in which it has a what we would call foundation stones, but in this architecture they are columns, uh, two special columns, which flank the, the master bed for the master and his wife. And these two columns are the foundation columns of the house from which the rest of the house is built. Uh, and uh, they provide protection for symbolic protection for the uh, master and of the house and his wife and the, the children who were born there. Uh, you'll see that they play a, an important role throughout the house in a moment. Uh, so here's an, a version of another house in which you get uh, rice bins over on the right hand side uh, separated from the main house then you get an entrance platform and an entrance guest room and a kitchen serving both and then a private threshold into the sleeping rooms and the wash place next to them. Notice how in the section uh, the floor level changes and steps up all the way till you get to the final sleeping room at the highest level. Underneath uh, these two important columns the foundation columns are here. And the main uh, activities of the women happen in relation to those columns. Uh, then you get very important animals nearby, less important animals further away. And here is are photographs of such a house in use, with a model on the bottom. Uh, but that is, of course, the communal eating area in the main guest room. They sat on the floor, of course. Everybody in the world did until uh, about 2500 BC. And uh, the, uh, in this case, there's no important raised area for the master of the house and his wife to eat from. So here's a reception in the one of the open air areas. <coughs> and then we come now to a royal building. <coughs> in <coughs> Bangkok, they have saved one of the uh, great homes of a prince and princess that was brought in from the countryside. <coughs> Unfortunately, it's been re-erected on concrete columns. It should, of course, be on wooden columns. But the rest of the building is a, a unique record of what a, a, a royal palace was like hundreds of years ago in Bangkok. And we see that it takes its form from that traditional house. It's the same basic kind of structure. Uh, the difference is, although the thin lines have disappeared from this drawing, the difference is that there was a, 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 a great staircase going up to a bridge which ran across here, which gave, uh, meant that you could have a reception area here for important visitors before they were allowed to come into the inner reception area for the royal uh, family themselves. The royal family lived on a raised platform. The line has disappeared around there, but you can see it clearly in the next photograph. There's the raised platform. <coughs> and the, uh, of course, royalty sat on this level and the visitors had to keep on the lower level around the edge. But what is most striking about the building is that it has no walls. Uh, it is simply open. It is unpretentious in that sense. Uh, just a great shaded platform for uh, a formal receipt on a higher level of the royalty receiving other people, lay people, who've come to visit them. Quite a fascinating building, isn't it? So Southeast Asian architecture evolved in this very simple way, keeping them the fundamental uh, simple construction, 
with a heavy roof to protect it from disintegrating in earthquakes, uh, but always maintaining these rather humble, simple forms, a raised platform sheltered from the storm. Uh, and it evolved from the hall house, the long house, through the extended family house down to the, these very fine buildings that we see in Bangkok. So that's to give you a sense of how uh, what we could call prehistoric architecture slowly evolved into what we know today in Asia. And we're talking here really about East Asia and Southeast Asia. And of course, there were many variations on that, which we'll be talking about later in the class. But I wanted to go back to the prehistoric roots, which we have no written record of, because writing wasn't available in the period when these hall houses and tribal houses developed. And we don't have writing anywhere in the world before 3000 BC, and then it was only lists of goods. The first written histories uh, we, we think we have are probably 1200 BC. And in Greece, they're only 600, 700 BC. Amazing, isn't it? The earliest poetry we have, six or 700 BC. Yeah. Well, they're not history in the sense that they tell us what they're about. They leave us to guess, don't they? A, a history that is something that actually explains something or records something clearly for us is very late. And in East Asia, much later. Uh, so we don't have records in China, for instance, that are before 1000 BC that are written records. Of course, some of them were destroyed uh, deliberately in certain periods of Chinese history. But we don't think that the Chinese had written histories before about 800 BC, if, if, as, late, if, if as early as that. And some people dispute that, think it's later. So we're talking about the long houses and the hall houses and the round houses going back probably to 20,000 BC, between uh, 8,000 and, and 15 to 20,000 BC. Very early structures. Uh, and amazing that they've come down to us as a type that is still being built in South America and was being built in, in the Indonesian islands until the Second World War. Quite amazing, isn't it? When you think how ancient a type it is. And it's from that that we get the beginnings of the domestic architecture we know today. <clears throat>